Hey, good morning to everybody. Thank you for coming out this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, for those of you who are guests today, our pastor, Scott Griffin, is out. I, um, I tied him off and I sent him off to Arizona. I'm just kidding. I, don't have, no, I have no clue where he's at. <laughs> uh, just a little backstory on um, how I know Scott, uh, if I haven't already told you. Uh, he and I uh, were teaching the juniors, um, the 9, 10, 11 year olds at uh, Brackett Church in Houston, Texas, uh, for a number of years. And uh, it's, a, it's a very great age uh, to teach. You know, they're at that age where they're transitioning from childhood and kind of the preteen years, and then, and then all of a sudden one day you see them become a man. Yeah. Some, of the, some of the children that I've taught are now married with children. And it's very, um, Shocking to see. It's like, what happened? <laughs> but uh, still, currently, I, I still teach, and it's, it's still a, f a very fun age. Um, they're very um, adamant about learning the Word of God. Um, not too long ago, I actually did the story of Gideon, uh, which is what we're actually going to be going over tonight. But before we do, um, just want to give everybody a fair morning. We got a lot to go over today. I hope everyone had their Memorial Day coffee. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, if the music hasn't given it away yet, yes, it is Memorial Day. And I think the message today about Gideon is very, very appropriate for today because Gideon was uh, a military man who went from a zero to a hero. Almost literally. But first, I just want to take a few moments to uh, recognize what this day is all about. It's a reminder of things that are greater than ourselves. It's a reminder for things that are greater than ourselves, things that are greater than our material wealth, Sing things greater than our personal belongings and our conveniences. Men and, women who, men and women who actually served in the military and the armed forces put their personal comforts aside to serve our country from enemies both foreign and domestic. They fought to protect our freedoms and our way of life. Now we hear that word freedom a lot. And that word freedom carries with it a lot of responsibility. And as a matter of fact, true freedom comes with responsibility and obligation. It is the freedom to go to church, the freedom to succeed, even the freedom to fail without oppression from outside entities. For over 200 years, this country has been a safe haven, not just for the people living here, but also for people all around the world. One patriotic, comedi uh, one patriotic comedian once said that you can always measure the greatness of a country by those who are coming in and those who are going out. But beware, though the United States has been a great country for a long time, such as the world has never seen, we must never forget the one who actually gave it to us. That is, of course, the Lord Jesus. Never let pride exceed your humility. It is very easy, just like myself, to be consumed with all the details of life and forget what it took for this country to actually be what it is today. So we are continuing on in the story of Judges. Let's see here. Ooh, hold on. There we go. That's not mine. Give me just a few moments. There we go. Yay. This is not my first time, I promise. There we go. There we go. Oh, by the way, happy Memorial, Memorial Day. I already said it, but it, just, it was up there, and I wanted to make sure that was seen. <laughs> now, 
Before we start, it was always a tradition at um, our church to, uh, to talk about one Medal of Honor recipient on Memorial Day. This one goes back to the 1940s. This is Army First Lieutenant Jack Treadwell. By spring of 1945, the end of World War II was imminent. The Allies had pushed into Germany, and that momentum may be what pushed Army First Lieutenant Jack Treadwell to single-handedly clear out six enemy bunkers and take 18 prisoners as his battalion hammered the Siegfried Line, Germany's last major defensive fortification. His action inspired his men and earned him the Medal of Honor. Treadwell was born in Ashland, Alabama in March 1919, but his family moved to Snyder, Oklahoma just a few years later. He graduated high school in 1937 and went to college for a year before enlisting in the Army in January 1941. He received a battlefield commission on March 23, 1944, after participating in the amphibious assault on Sicily in July 1943, and also Salerno in September 1943 in the Battle of Anzio. On March 18, 1945, a 25-year-old Treadwell found himself in the 45th Infantry Division commanding F Company near Niederwurzbach, Germany. His unit was pinned down from heavy fire and artillery at the base of a hill the Sieg, uh, along the Siegfried Line, which consisted of interlocking trenches and concrete bunker, bunkers known as pillboxes. That's a funny name. After eight soldiers were gunned down trying to attack a single point, Treadwell, de Treadwell decided to clear a path for his company alone. Armed with a submachine gun and hand grenades, Treadwell pushed forward over the terrain, <clears throat> which offered no cover from the hail of gunfire coming his way. He fired at the tiny opening in the, fill in the first pillbox and launched grenades into it. When he got close enough, he shoved his muzzle inside, forcing four Germans to surrender. A fifth was found dead inside. After sending those prisoners back to the American line, Treadwell continued on through an, an onslaught of gunfire to the next pillbox, where he did the exact same thing, even capturing the commander of that defensive position. That caused confusion and havoc among the ranks of the Germans who continued to aim machine gun and sniper fire in his direction. But the lieutenant continued his whirlwind of assaults and took four more pillboxes. Treadwell's intensity inspired his men who stormed after him and overwhelmed the rest of the Germans on the hillside. Their success drove a wedge into the Siegfried line, making it possible for their battalion to take its objective. Treadwell, uh, Treadwell faced impossible odds when he chose to charge the pillboxes alone, but he did it anyway. That bravery and selflessness vastly helped the Allied cause, and it earned him the Medal of Honor, which he received as a newly minted captain from President Harry Truman on September 14, 1945. By the end of World War II, he had taken part in eight major campaigns with the 45th Infantry Division. Thought that was a pretty cool story. It always, uh, when I read stories like that, it always kind of makes me reflect on just some of the petty things that we take for granted. Here we have small problems that go on at home, and meanwhile, gentlemen like this, who are very selfless, uh, are throwing grenades into little pillboxes. And so it always just kind of reminds me that you know my problems are always small compared to the, some of the problems like this gentleman faces. Very similar to what Gideon faced as well. All right. This here is the theme of Judges chapter 17 verse 6. You don't have to turn to it, but many theologians actually have said that this is actually the theme of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now, what this means in today's, in com comparative to today's culture, it's subjective morality. In other words, 
The people of Israel did not have any absolutes to work off of. Sure, they knew of the God of Israel, but they operated functionally day in and day out on a sliding scale of morality and spirituality. The nation of Israel did not have a human king at this time. Israel was unique, set apart from other nations because God ruled over them, meeting with them in the Ten of Tabernacles, as you'll find in the Mosaic Law. But unfortunately, due to Israel's disobedience, continued disobedience, through the worshiping of false gods like Baal and Asherah, as divine discipline, God allowed them to be overcome by their neighboring enemies. As with any nation, though, where the, found, where the foundational spiritual heritage goes awry, so goes its leadership. I think we can see that going on in our country today. The spiritual leadership was actually, in, if you look in the book of Judges, it's nowhere to be found in the book of Judges. You can't find any mention of the Levitical priesthood anywhere in that entire book or temple worship or anything like that. The only time you hear of any worshiping going on is by Gideon. And that's after he got a miracle that confirmed that what the person that was talking to him was actually the angel of the Lord. Outside of that, there's no, there's no other spiritual leadership. We strongly desire good leadership in this country, right? Or in any organization for that matter, whether you're a teacher or in a church or anywhere or even at home, good leadership is very needed politically, politically and spiritually. We need those with integrity, character, and most of all, a thick, a, a thick skin and a backbone. Amen to that. Oops, why am I going backwards? There we go. Proverbs 29.2 When the righteous increase, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Other passages like this affirm the necessity of good leadership. Leadership with integrity, I should say. We can have leaders, but if there's no integrity... Things can get a little awry. Going back to the discipline of the Lord, what that was about, God's discipline for any nation or even an individual, it's never meant to exasperate God's children. Never. Of course, when you were little, you can probably think of your parents disciplining you and you probably didn't like them for it, right? That just kind of goes with the territory. But as you grown older, you realize that a lot of that discipline was for your own good and for my good. I can look back on it and say, wow, that really helped. Some of those techniques I even use today. But that was, their, that was God's way of getting their attention, to draw them back to them, uh, to draw the Israelites back to God, because their hearts had been hardened. And God heard the cries of his people, and he had compassion on them. And he sent the judges of Israel to deliver them from their oppressors. Well, I don't have time to go into all the judges, because that would take several months. We're just going to focus on Gideon this morning. Before God empowers Gideon and his army to go out to war, to fight the Midianites, the Lord must first address the issues that are going on in his own backyard at home, in his own soul. The next point is important for all of us. No matter what is going on in the nation or in the present circumstances, even in the United States of America, God is always interested in what is happening with your own soul. The next verse is from Proverbs 23, 5. This is the famous, the Lord is my shepherd song. When you go to first, verse 5, this one is, hits me pretty hard. Because it says that, you, it says that uh, David is talking to the Lord and he's saying, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. 
If you can picture that in your mind on a battlefield or surrounded by people that have it in for you, you picture the Lord coming to you, setting up a table and having dinner. That's a, I don't, I don't know, there seems to be a lot of distractions uh, if sitting down, on a t sitting down with the Lord Jesus Christ and you've got enemies surrounding you, but that's how God works. Enemies can't stop Him. Enemies can't stop your spiritual life. That's the whole point. So the Midianites, the Amalekites, and the people of the East came in and overpowered Israel as part of their divine discipline. Again, leadership was lacking in Israel at this time, and it was very rare to find a good man, or woman for that matter. This man, Gideon, was not a general at all. He was no general Patton, and he was not a priest. He was just regular old layman. He was like a water boy. But despite his lack of credentialed, cred, uh, credentials, he was positive to the Word of God. And he had a willing heart to fight. But he had a hard time. Aside from his short resume, he couldn't reconcile how all the disaster that happened in Israel, he couldn't figure out how all the disaster happened. He couldn't reconcile that with the history of God's miraculous dealing with Israel to deliver them from Egypt. How is it possible to once be ruled by God and now overcome by enemies? How did that happen? Divine discipline. But the Lord was getting ready to tweak and update his worldview drastically. Gideon is going to get some leadership training and he's going to get a crash course in it. Crash course, uh, crash course training, number one. God is preparing Gideon to rise above the reality of his circumstances. We'll talk about what that means. So his first step in leadership training was not to go to boot camp like you would in the army, but a true a leader needs the tranquility of the soul. A leader needs to be stable in his own soul to have and get his emotions under control. In Judges 6, chapters 13 through 14, or Judges 6, verses 13 through 14, it says this, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. And the Lord looked at him and said, Go in the strength, go in your strength, and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Now that's pretty telling, isn't it? it you know, the Lord's trying to say, This is what I want you to, or uh, Gideon is trying to say, Lord, why, is this all the, why has all this happened? And a normal. A general, just a general person off the street or somebody might just say, you know what, everything is going to be okay. It's going to be all right. The Lord cuts through all of that and He says, go in your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? Again, what God is trying to do with Midian is get him to rise above his circumstances to kind of get out of this a victim mindset. And the Lord's not being insensitive at all. He is not being insensitive, but he is getting Gideon to rely on him and not on his emotions, not on his circumstances. You'll hear me uh, repeat this a lot, and that is, that is this. The outside pressures of life can't outweigh 
the living God, the presence of the Lord. The Lord God should be more real to us than our present circumstances, the reality of that. Gideon needed tranquility and stability of the soul if he is to lead others. Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. I'm skipping some of the verses. Uh, I went over this on Wednesday. Um, I don't think we'll have time to go review the whole section again of how we got to this point. But the Lord confirmed His authority that the person that was speaking to Gideon was indeed the Lord God himself. And this gave Gideon peace, peace of the soul. But also, what really stuck out to me was, it didn't say the Lord brings peace, although he does do that, but he says the Lord is peace. In other words, the Lord is the source of our peace. I think that's very telling and very important for us to remember because sometimes we can look at look, find peace in the wrong places. Sometimes we try to find peace by getting a certain um, political party in power, then we'll have peace, right? And we can let our guard down. Uh-uh. Doesn't it does not work that way? And that if if we ever get into the position of having all of our elected officials that we want in power, that actually can be a danger zone because you can let your guard down very easy. And we're gonna also see that in the story of Gideon as well. What happens when you let your guard down? So again, the Lord just didn't bring Gideon into the war. He just didn't bring him out guns blazing. He had to get, he had to get him to be at peace with Him first. God is very concerned with us and our own mental health, spiritual health, not just our body. God is very concerned about those who bear His image. That can, I cannot stress that enough. And a leader must be aware of what's going on in his or her own soul. It's no different today, no different at all. What we see on the news and what we see in the streets today and what we see in society at large, that did not just happen overnight. It just kind of seems like society just, a, just came unglued, but that did not happen overnight. This was the fruit of something that started long ago. And if we really want to see peace or change in the United States of America, it starts with the gospel of peace. Not just peace for eternal life, that's the start of it. Knowing that we're, we're saved and we're going to heaven, that's just the start. But the, but the gospel is the means for the rest of our spiritual life that gives peace in our present circumstances, uh, that gives peace uh, for, for everything. So that's a, a very important to remember. And that's even part of our armor that Pastor Griffin went over in great detail. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15. You don't have to go there right now since there's a big distance between Judges and Ephesians. Ephesians six fifteen, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Good footwear is very critical, isn't it? Especially when you're playing football or soccer or, any, or in time of war, you got to wear those big boots and you got to learn how to run in those boots. I watched a soccer player one time, um, a professional soccer player in England on TV, uh, and he was joking around with his friend and what they were trying to do is they were trying to play soccer in sandals. You ever tried to do that? It was actually very humorous to watch. One of the guys could not kick a field goal to, or kick a goal to save his life. So good footwear is very, very, very necessary. In battle, the sandals that being talked about, 
You can't see it here, but they were studded. They had cleats back then. Because when you were about ready to engage in the enemy, you kind of stood down, you kind of bent your knees a little bit to get a firm, a firm grip on the ground so you didn't sway in battle. So it gave you a firm standing to stand against the enemy, and you need good sandals to travel long distances. So I cannot stress that enough about God bringing peace to the soul. That's first and foremost if God is going to change anything in America or any nation that bears God's name. We have to address what's going on in our soul and also what's going on in our own backyard. So now, the, Gideon has erected this altar to the Lord called, The Lord is Peace. So this altar is like a, a brick structure. And there it stood, even during the time when the Judges was written. It stood for probably maybe about 100, 200 years. Somewhere after that, it was torn down. So when Gideon erects an altar the, to the Lord in his, own, in his own hometown, he called it the Lord his peace. So in the same way that Gideon built an altar the, to the Lord, whenever we recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as a Savior, not just of our, for et our eternal life, but also our circumstances, then all the other altars that we erect must come down. Must come down. This is where we continue on. Judges 6.25. That same night that the Lord, the Lord said to him, the same, the morning time, the Lord met with Gideon. And that's when Gideon built the altar to the Lord. But then later that night... He said to him, Take your father's bull and the second bull, seven years old, and pull down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Basically, tear down your father's property. And then he goes on to say, and build an altar to the Lord your God on the top of the stronghold here with stones laid in due order. So he wants Gideon to build another altar. Then take the second bull and offer it as a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah that you cut down. And Gideon took men of his servants, uh, I'm sorry, Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had told him. But because he was too afraid of his family and the men of the town to do it by day, he did it by night. Just a couple of uh, points here. If God is going to deliver a nation, he's going to do it his way, always. God is immutable. He does not change. The tearing down of the pagan altars was commanded by God even before the Israelites went into the promised land. You can write this down for reference, Exodus 34.1 and Deuteronomy 12.3. Point number three, the Lord will not share His glory with any other false god at all. That's from Isaiah 48.11. You will not find one of those coexist stickers on the back of God's fiery chariot. You're not going to find it. To bring about change, you cannot whitewash the devil's world. To bring about change means going back to the very instructions that God instituted from the very beginning. Again, God doesn't change. It kind of reminds me of the story of Jonah. God wanted him to go to the Ninevites. Then Jonah went through all this trouble. He, he got into a lot of trouble, and he just strayed from God's path. And then finally, after, after his little uh, ordeal on the, in the ocean with the big fish, God commanded the same thing again. He, didn't re he just repeated himself. He didn't tell him 
anything different. It's no different today. And that's good, isn't it? For God to not have him to change what he's already commanded. And thank God he doesn't change because we do a lot. If we fall off track with the word of God, it's always best just to go back to the beginning. Nothing wrong with that. Going back to the basics. Sometimes if you, if you ever play professional basketball or even college basketball or high school basketball, if your technique is a little sloppy, the coach is going to make you go back and run laps and do basics. Uh, uh, same like football. Basics, nothing wrong with that. So this thing that God is getting, uh, getting to do, this is not just any side job. This is very intentional of the Lord. God is actually answering Gideon's question about why all this has happened to Israel. But he answers it not by saying, oh, Gideon, this is what happened, brother. Your people worshiping idols. He doesn't say that. God involves his people with the solution, always. It's no different today. And you notice that the Lord God never said to Gideon that and I mentioned this earlier, that this is the reason why Israel is suffering. He doesn't say that. He just says, I am with you, and this is what you got to do. The reality of God's presence had to be more real than, our, than the present circumstances. And that is why God is called the living God, because this, the living God assumes that God is living, that He is active, and He's here with us today. And that is true. All right, moving on to verse 28. After I'm done with these verses, we're going to, it's going to get a little bit heavy here because we're going to talk about some things that are going on in our own culture that are very similar to what is going on in these next passages. When the men of the town rose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah beside it was cut down. The Asherah, they, it was kind of like a, a, a pole that was made out of a tree. So it was, you had to take a chainsaw. Well, they didn't have chainsaws back then. They had to take a saw and cut that thing down. And the second bull was offered on the altar that had been built. That was actually part of the Mosaic law. And they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And after they had searched and inquired, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. I guess his ten servants couldn't keep quiet. You can't keep something like that quiet when you tear something like that down. I'm surprised that uh, his dad didn't wake up. Then the men of the town said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die. For he has broken down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah beside it. That's pretty brazen for the town folk to come out and, and say, Hey, Joash, get your son out of here. We want to execute him. That's really brazen. Of course, um, even though that Joash himself was involved in Baal worship, he wasn't having any of that. But Joash said to all the, who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? Whoever contends for him shall be put to death by morning. If he is God, let him contend for himself, because his altar has been broken down. Well, good job, Joash. Hats off to you. You're being the, sticking up for your son. That's good. That's good. I think that Joash, uh, whenever he found out about his sta statues, I think his conscience really got to him. He's like, I shouldn't be doing this. My son did the right thing. So good for Joash. So if this nation is going to survive, that means that the spiritual strongholds that God's people have allowed to come in must be taken down. Not just the statue itself, but the spiritual strongholds that come with it, meaning the demonic influences. And we're going to get into that here shortly. 
God's people were forbidden to make any graven image that represents a false god, number one, and that includes making an image that is made to represent the God of Israel. Why was that a big deal? If, if I make a statue right now and say, and I stick it right here and I say, this is the Lord God of Israel who has delivered me, that's misrepresenting God. That's what he's talking about in the second commandment. You shall not make a gra graven, Im graven image of anything in heaven or on the earth. That's a big deal because, number one, it, uh, it misrepresents God's character, his very essence, his very nature. He is the creator, right? Not the creation. So God is eternal. He has no beginning and no end. If I build a statue that represents God, that is created and that will eventually have an end. That does not represent God's character. God is immutable. He, he does not change. But an idol, that can change. And God can't have any images that misrepresent His very character. An example of this, and I'm going to jump to Exodus real quick, uh, because I think this is very, very, very relevant. Oh, all right. Remember that? The golden calf, Exodus 32, 4 through 5. So let's read what it says. So Aaron, whenever Moses was uh, on top of the mountain, getting the Ten Commandments from God, Aaron was down with all the people, and they convinced him that he should make a god, a graven image. And Aaron, it says he, but it means Aaron, and he received from the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Uh-oh. There was no golden calf that brought them out of Egypt. Nope. So you, you probably know the story of what happened after that. I probably don't need to go into detail, but uh, it wasn't pretty. Going back to the... Uh, to the Baal idols and the Asherah poles that were torn down. And I mentioned this earlier, not only the physical presence had to be removed, but also the demonic influences or the possession of the individuals in the surrounding area had to be taken care of because the presence of that idol meant a, a, a demonic presence that was associated with that idol. That's very important to recognize. So just uh, thinking back to the time of Gideon when the Baal statue was taken down in the Asherah pole, what was going on? What kind of emotions did you see or hear? You heard fear. Gideon was afraid, right? Yeah, he, didn't, he knew the townspeople would get on him about that. He was very afraid and he was very intimidated, very intimidated. I mean, they were, very, they were brazen enough to come to his dad's house and say, get your son out of here. We want to have a word with him. So there's fear, intimidation, and violence. Is this happening in the United States today? Yes, it is. And as a church, we have to be aware of it because we must bring those spiritual issues to the throne room of grace. And the, and the church has to deplatform these strongholds. It's, it, we can't just ignore it. And we're going to get into detail uh, a couple of examples of what it is I'm talking about. And again, what I'm, what I'm about to go into is just the spiritual aspect. I don't want to get into the political aspect or, or anything like that. I just want to focus on the spiritual side of it. Because what I'm about to talk about, these influences, 
This is recognized, uh, what, I'm, what I'm about to say is actually recognized by an organization. But it, I'm trying not to spill the beans here, but, but let me just continue on. So, you ever heard of divination? It's a form of witchcraft, right? Very prominent in the Old Testament and even in the New. Paul actually had to um, reprimand some of the people in Galatia for, for their witchcraft, or what's called in some translations, sorcery. So there is a form of div divination called necromancy that is practiced by some witches and so-called uh, so wizards or warlocks. So what is necromancy? I'm getting to my point here, just bear with me. So necromancy is the supposed practice of communicating with the dead, especially in order to predict the future or obtain some hidden knowledge or skill. This is sometimes referred to as black magic. And just as a reminder, this is strictly forbidden in the Old Testament because only God is qualified to share a message and this form of prophetic telling that necromancy or divination comes from the demonic powers, from Satan. Now, next, I'm going to share with you a quote from a certain organization. Again, not focused on the political aspects, although it can spill over into that. We're not just a social justice movement. This is a spiritual movement. We've, been, we've become very intimate with the spirits that we call on regularly. The co-founder goes on to say that it is literally almost resurrecting the spirits so they can work through us to get the work that we need to get done. This person is uh, calling on spiritual powers, spiritual help by way of necromancy or divination. What organization? BLM. BLM. This is advertised. This is not hidden. It's out there. So there's pagan spiritual practices that are being used to influence America, to influence our leaders, to influence families by fear, intimidation. Again, very similar to what's going on with Gideon right here. There's a stronghold. But I'll try to be as neutral as possible. Regardless of what you think of this organization, that's beside the point. Whether you think they're as gentle as sheep or ravenous as wolves or anything in between, anytime that we invoke a spirit by way of necromancy or some form of divination, we're calling on the demonic power. Period. And nothing good can ever come of that. I don't care what organization it is. If they're the sweetest and the most nicest organization that has ever come up to you and just showered you with love but, but uses witchcraft, that's, wolf, that's a wolf in sheep's clothing. God does not work like that. And unfortunately, there's some churches that embrace this. And by association, there's, there's that association with witchcraft. Not to say that a church has practiced the witchcraft itself, but there is that influence. The point is, we need to keep it in prayer, period, and defeat it on the spiritual battleground. Next one, you, you might remember this. Again, this is very relevant to what we're talking about today. So on January 3rd, 2021, Congress opened up with their first session with a prayer. And at the very end, this congressman invoked a certain name. We ask it 
in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and a God known by many names by different faiths, Amen and a, a Woman. Now, that last part, Amen and A Woman, that's kind of like a play on words. The internet had so much fun with that. But that wasn't really the part that really stuck out to me. It was the part that came before that. Who's Brahma? It's a, it's a pagan Indian god, the god of destruction. But it's supposed to be this overarching big god that's out there. But again, he's attributing a certain name to God that does not belong to him. That's almost that's the, like the equivalent, equivalent of a graven image. Because you're ascribing to him a name or a characteristic that does not belong to him. By the way, Brahma is not monotheistic. It's polytheistic. Again, this is just to keep it in prayer. Because if we don't attack it, uh, if we don't go after it, or we, I shouldn't say we, God goes after it. We don't have that power. But we have to meet it on the spiritual forefront first. As I said earlier, if the name of God is going to be magnified, especially in church, then all idols must come down. And there is a New Testament reference to this. You don't have to turn to it now. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 13, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church about the cup of the Lord, communion, and the cup of demons. He's telling the Corinthians, look, you can't have it both ways. You can't serve God and the demons at the same time. It's just not going to happen. So this is not just an Old Testament thing. This is a New Testament thing as well. We can't misrepresent God. Now, for Gideon and the town folk, the Baal statue and the Asherah pole have been torn down and the strongholds that have, have now been broken. Yay. <clears throat> so next... Now all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east came together and they crossed the Jordan and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abizrites were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him. And he sent messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they went up to meet him. This is just a little bit of a sidebar. What I think is very interesting is that the tribe of Manasseh, Gideon's tribe, and these three, three tribes, other three tribes mentioned here, those are four out of the five tribes that did not drive out the Canaanites completely. I find that very interesting and significant. Maybe God has given them a chance to do what they were supposed to do, to, to be involved in the solution. Sometimes we can screw things up, but God still wants to involve us in the solution. What happened to the fifth tribe? Well, that's a little bit later. Now, the Lord has empowered Gideon with his spirit and sound of revelry to his fellow clansmen to assemble for battle. He also called the three other tribes... And God put his very own armor on Gideon, his very own armor. Gideon could not do this by himself. He could not do this by himself. He was afraid. He didn't have a resume. He was no General Patton. He could not strike fear in the hearts of people. He was a water boy. But God's power was with him. God's power and God's provision gave him peace. It gave him peace of soul. Again, as I say earlier, it was no accident that God first met with him face to face. Even when there was enemy patrols looking, looking around, God still met with him face to face to give him what he needed, peace in the soul. And again, that's key for any leadership, 
for any leadership, or for anybody for that matter. Whether you lead your family, whether you lead a school board, whether you lead a classroom of one child or 50 children, there has to be the contentment, the peace in the soul to be able to think under pressure. Uh, I think this is a good stopping point. Um, we'll cut it off here. Uh, we'll meet in about 15 minutes and we'll finish up with the rest of the story. And what we'll go over some other points after we get back about what this really means to us today. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for these stories, Lord, that uh, provide us with uh, a track history of what you've done for your people. And we just pray, Lord, that this may be a continued encouragement for us, Lord, and pray that you'll give our, our spirits and our minds and our bodies the rest, that we need, the rest that we need to be able to face any enemy, both foreign and domestic, and ask it in your Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.